Excuse me. All right. Well, good afternoon to people all around the world. Good evening if you're in Europe. Good 2002 if you are in Asia, Australia, or places where already it has passed January 1st. I'm Fred Plotkin. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music and opera happen. As you know, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. When I thought, who would I want to have ring out the old year and ring in the new, only one person came to mind, and that is my dear friend, Martina Arroyo. And because I really want to see you, my dear, I'm taking off these glasses, but I think the message has been delivered. <laughs> Hi, Martina. How Hi. are you? Very well, thank you. And you? Very well, thank you. I'm, in case someone is too young to know, like a four-year-old or a three-year-old, who is Martina Arroyo? Martina is one of America's greatest opera singers, opera stars, beloved citizens, someone who has given back so much more than she has received. And she's received a lot, but she's given even more. So uh, you are a soprano, you are a teacher. We're going to get into who you are. But Martina, I have a question for you that I've never asked you. I think I we're friends long enough that I can ask you. And it's a serious question. Are you aware how beloved you are? Oh, what a question. I know that I meet wonderful people all the time, all, new people, old people, friends. And, and I, I know that I'm certainly accepted. And that's wonderful. You, you want to be a part of everything. You try to be a part of everything, but you can't. But I, you know, when I say your name, when people hear recordings, when they see you on either new television programs or revivals of The Tonight Show or The Odd Couple or the Kennedy Center Honors or teaching or intermission features in the Metropolitan Opera broadcasts. Uh, it's kind of like it's an automatic smile. We have a dear friend in common named Mark Rucker and Mark, yes. in addition to being a wonderful baritone is also, uh, I think his title is Administrative Director of the Martina Royal Foundation about which we'll talk. And he was my guest here in June. And I was telling him that when I'm low and blue, which is thankfully not all that often, but when I'm low and blue, um, you left me an answering machine message many years ago and I never erased it. And if I need to pick me up, I just play the message. <laughs> well, it was, it was a very sweet message. There was nothing, there was nothing, you were not being jokey or anything. It was a very sweet, kind, sincere message. And, you know, I've had many people call me in my life and I don't keep all the messages, but your message I have kept. And Mark said, I understand completely and entirely what you're saying. And mm -hmm. so I say this not just to pay you a compliment because you know already I love you, but because I think it's important for listeners who may not be as acquainted with you as many of us are, to understand that not only are you a great artist and teacher and citizen, but you very particularly have carved out a niche. I don't think you tried to, I think it just happened, of being very beloved and cared about. People ask me about you all the time and how is Martina and so on. And I, as you know, I keep up on you and I know how you are. Um, so enough with the compliments. <laughs> I did recall, you received a call from Vienna just day before yesterday from the lady who used to be in charge at the Met of, um, oh, I forget what her title was. Um, and we, we talked for a long, long time. And after we got off, I thought, my God, why would she call me? And it, it's, it always makes me surprised and happy to know that people remember. People remember your name. They remember who you are. And uh, I remember those people. I'm, it's amazing how much you remember. That's all I can oh, say. I know. Well, it's a good thing, too. Uh, just so listeners understand, um, you sang your last performance at the Met on October 31st, 1986. That was Aida. 
It was your 199th performance of the Met. I was the performance manager. I was there for the whole thing, for the whole production. And um, you and I had met a few years before and we worked together as colleagues. I would say that our friendship solidified in 1993, I think it was, we when you and I here. were on a cruise ship together that was like something out of the Flying Dutchman because we were sailing in the North Atlantic in Iceland and Greenland and we never got to the Faroe Islands and we were trapped at sea and, and <laughs> you and I were both working technically. We were doing master classes and lectures, but it was one of those voyages you were with your husband in which basically everybody on the ship except for me and five German women was so seasick, the captain was seasick and so on, that the five German women wanted to be entertained and they wanted their money's worth and the poor band was too sick to perform and the house doctor was sick and everybody was sick. So I went down to the kitchen of the ship and cooked for the five women and I came to the top of the ship and I would do the announcements for the captain because he was too nauseated to speak. And I would do them in English and German because it was sort of a bilingual cruise and French and Spanish. And then I would do it in Italian. And they said to me, but we don't have any Italian passengers. I said, that doesn't matter. I want to do it in Italian. And I went to visit you at one point. They gave you a wonderful cabin, but it was at the front of the ship, which meant that the impact of the waves was much stronger in your elegant cabin than in my midship cabin. And <laughs> you said to me, I think we need to work on your German. And that solidified our friendship. <laughs> but I, I know you probably remember that cruise. It was not the cruise line's fault. It was just extremely bad weather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Martina, I think I, I want to start with uh, something that you and I know that you are a native New Yorker. We were both born in Manhattan. We grew up not too far from one another. Uh, in doing my research, so I discovered something I didn't know about you, that your father worked, he was an engineer at the Brooklyn Navy Yards, mm -hmm. which means he was probably a few years older than my dad, but not too many, that he may have known my father who worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yards really? as a musician. My father was one of those musicians who entertained the sailors and, and played at all the dances as the ships went in and out for, in World War II. And my father was associated with that group. He was working hard underneath. Did he hear any music there? Do you have any idea? I don't know if he made note of it or, or, or followed up. I mean, mm -hmm. he went down and worked in the yeah. boiler rooms. Because some of my earliest memories were actually being taken by my father to the Brooklyn Navy Yard to see where he performed because he performed. It was like out of a Leonard Bernstein musical of On the Town that um, you, the sailors would come in for 24, 48 hours. Uh, they would be on the ships. So now I gather your dad was working on constructing the ships, which was a phenomenal effort at that time. Pardon me? My father was probably one of those yelling, shut up. <laughs> um, but I know you grew up with music. And the first thing I want to talk to you about is something, again, that I know about, but I'd like you to address to our public. Talk about Hunter College, its role in New York City, Hunter College High School as well. I was very aware of friends who went to Hunter College High School and then Hunter College. It's a very important place in our city, but not necessarily known to people elsewhere. Well, that's true, but it's a wonderful high school. It's a place where you can really grow individually. You know, you're not stuck in a group of people. You, you were allowed to come out and be yourself. And uh, high school, the high school years were wonderful uh, freeing years instead of slamming down on a person's personality. And then I went to the college and I realized what the regular life was, which was not individual at all. And not, um, um, we weren't taken for what we had individually, that's all, you know, but it was a great high school, great college. You know, it's, um, 
but I still loved the high school very, very much. What was particular about it? Because everyone I know who went there adored it and revered it and, and spoke so highly of it. I think it's because you were allowed to be yourself, to grow out. You know, you didn't have to be in a group. You could be a very, any type of person you, you are. And, and people just didn't encourage it. They just allowed it, it happened, you know? And, and we gave parties and, 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 and performances of uh, every year, in a musical performance, everybody showed, showed off. And it was very relaxing, it was freeing. And I loved the high school and the college, but mostly the high school. And I know you've remained involved with Hunter all through the years, not only as a place where the foundation works, and we'll talk about that later, but in terms of representing the school and guiding the school. And we were both friends with Regina Resnick, and I think she went there and was involved with Hunter. She was. I didn't guide the school, Hunter High School, very much. We held our classes and meetings there sometimes, but we didn't get involved with the, with the doings of the school. Okay. Still a great school. And it still is, to my knowledge. It remains. So people from elsewhere who are unfamiliar, it's one of the many things in New York City that people who are not from the city don't understand about the, I call it an Italian, tessuto urbano, the, the urban texture of our city, where people from all walks of life and backgrounds and economic statuses can cross and intermingle. And that's something that I happen to love about our city is that more than most places, everybody tends to mix unless there's a pandemic, but. And even then they'll try. Even then they'll try, it's true. Um, I also discovered about you something else that we had in common that I didn't know is your particular love for an Italian author, Ignazio Silone. Oh, you love Silone. I do love Silone and I studied him when I went to college in Italy and I studied Silone in Italy when he was still alive actually. And um, I had a teacher, a dottoressa in, in Bologna who spent a lot of time teaching us Silone. How did you discover Silone in Hunter College or perhaps Hunter High? And well, your connection to him. Actually, I had an prof Italian professor who, who introduced us to many people. He not only did we have to read in Italian and, and follow certain rules, but he introduced us to many people. And he introduced Silone to me, and I'm forever grateful. But he's, um, he's a, an author that you, you understand him because you understand who he is. You, you get to know him. Uh, you love him. Either, either you love him or you, do, you hate him, but you, mm -hmm. I don't know many people who hate him. Um, and it's one of the memories I, of Hunter College I don't forget, my it being, having been introduced to Silone. And I so, moved into a building, excuse me, on yeah. uh, 59th Street, and I walked into the hall and the lady stood there and she said, uh, oh, Arroyo, she was a, a, a tenant, she was not a worker, and she said, so you are the other Siloni fan, eh? fan. And I said, yes, and she said, yes, I'm the other one. You mean there are only two of us? <laughs> and she lived there for many years. I think she still might still do live here. But um, she, we talked about Siloni whenever we met. We, somehow his name came up. So for people who don't know, he was from central southern Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a book called Pane e Vino. E Vino e Pane. Vine Pano. Now, I, I know that it was sort of turned around the title. I'm not sure why. It was another book. I mean, it was another book. I see. I see. And he wrote Fontamara, Bitter Fount, Bitter Well or Fountain or Source. Mm -hmm. That was actually the one that got me first because it was a I, I'm a big lover of Ibsen. And my favorite Ibsen play is The Enemy of the People, which is about the spoiling of water and what it does to a population. And, you know, as we live and breathe today, we see this in Flint, Michigan, and we see this in Hawaii, I recently learned. And somehow the contamination of water is a violation that is uniform in the way it touches people and the devastation it can have. But Siloni wrote about very poor people. 
and people attached to their land. Yeah, and for them, it was also agriculture so that the water, they lived on bread and wine, basically, which is not just that they so had bad. these, pardon me? It isn't so bad. living on. No, bread. I know. <laughs> Add a little cheese and we're done. <laughs> I'm ready. But, but Sinone was a marvelous leader for many countries and people in various countries don't know his name. Yeah. So you and I are going to have to lead a revival of interest in Ignacio Silone. So we're starting that today. Everybody in 2022, go out and get a copy of one of his books. They're widely translated. He was in his time a very well-known, well-regarded Italian author who was known abroad and his books were translated. But I think um, it's just the lady in your building, you and me, who continue to carry the torch for Ignazio Silone. Actually, it was a, a professor at Hunter College who, who carried that torch. And then I met the lady in the building. Okay. <laughs> and she <laughs> a friend and uh, that professor, I don't know, as a matter of fact, it might be a little past his time, but he loved, when he loved something, he loved it with all his heart. And you took on the, you, you grabbed that love from him. And so it, it meant a great deal to, to know who Silone and read Silone and talk about him. And she was the only person I could talk to him or to her about. I also know that while you were at Hunter and just after and reading Silone and others, that you worked as a social worker for a while. Yes, I did. How did that happen? I, I can picture that perfectly, but tell me how it happened and what you drew from that. Well, it was one of my first employments because in actual fact, um, I started my professional career as a, as a so, social worker. And a, it wasn't really a social worker. I was at first someone who went from house and family to family and found and, and, and found out were they in, uh, involved with getting in payments from the city? Should they get in payments or what? But I met wonderful people from the street. And I mean, when I mean that, I don't mean on the street, I mean from the life that knew so much about life. They taught me so much because they were living it and they were having problems with it. And they, and, and they were, they were all, there was such a happiness among these people. It's, it's incredible to say, but these people were happy. Not happy because they didn't have very much, but happy because they, I don't know, they, they found a way to smile. And I, I'm foreshadowing my questions about opera because in, preparing for our conversation today, I, I found it significant, number one, Silona, and number two, social work. You were obviously clearly evidently humane and human before, but I wonder the degree to which experiencing the literature and the characters and, and the, the sufferings of the characters in Silone and the reality of life and all of its diversity and all of its richness and and challenge, how those experiences and that knowledge got translated into opera, forming opera characters and, and roles study and things like that. Uh, but you see, I would turn it around. I would say that they, they came first. My father and mother kept me involved in living in that city. I, I knew what was going on. Um, it wasn't the literature that made me aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, and they were great socializers in that they would take part in anything that was uh, for the city, for children, um, for the cities of the, of the neighborhood. And consequently I did, and I knew what was going on. And, and coming from Hunter High School, which was rather closed off to certain elements of, of our society, my father said, no, this, this is the way it really is. Mm. And that helped a great deal, a great, great deal. You know, I go back to school and, and have stories that they say, oh, keep quiet, you know, that's not true. And it was true because they didn't want to see it as true, many of them. But then we had the few that did and they went out and they did things. And they, as a matter of fact, I don't hear from them as much anymore. This is a sad thing, but I heard from them for a long time. And I heard what was going on in California, which from Shirley uh, and, and other parts of the state from other, other friends that kept contact. And that was wonderful. That was incredible. I, I wanted to do the kids from the normal high schools, and I say normal is in a stupid way, because Hunter High School was a normal high school, but it was a small 
high school. So we kept in contact with each other. And when they moved, when we moved out, we still kept contact for a long, long while. And that's very important. I can say that from my high school, I have contact, minimal contact with maybe five people. Really? And, awesome. yeah. five and people. I went to high school in New York City as well, but it was just not a, it was not structured in the same way. And but you went to a bigger high school, didn't you? I went to a large, not the biggest, but a large high school, but it was a very, it was a forced environment of being very competitive, which is something I didn't embrace. Mm -hmm. And so the students who were very competitive, I had no interest in. Mm -hmm. And the ones who were not very competitive were often very dispirited. I was not dispirited. I just sort of felt that I'm here to learn. Mm -hmm. And that was my focus. And I, I, I did learn a lot. But um, it was, I had experiences elsewhere away from my high school that were much more formative for me as a citizen of New York City and as someone who has devoted his life to the arts and to culture, but also to, um, I, I'm an egalitarian, as I think you know, and to me, that's the first word that I use to describe myself. I believe that everyone of all backgrounds and of all advantages or disadvantages deserves equal access and benefit and, and to draw what one can from society, but also to give back to society. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I framed my introduction of you, and I didn't write it, I just said it from the heart, that yes, you've received a lot, but you've given even much more than you have received. I mean that. I'm not saying that as your loving friend, but I'm saying that because I, I want people to know that if they don't, because it's just a fact. Um, so <laughs> I want to argue with you because what I got from from the high school going to into the college, working in social work, meeting the people on the outside, being involved with their with their sometimes with their eating, you know, they, they, it, it meant so much. And it all started nearly not from the school, but from my home. My father and mother always said, the, the door is always open. Sometimes I'd come in our home and there'd be a stranger I had seen on the street that my father had said, come in and have something to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, and he'd go in the house and, and say to my mother, Lucia, pick something for this man. He hasn't eaten all day. Mm -hmm. And that, I grew up with that. That's, that made more of an impression. I was one of those kids as a small child who was actually invited into other people's homes because um, my parents were divorced. My father was a very loving man, but he was not around all the time. He regretted that. He really wanted to be present. Uh, my mother worked. We didn't have any extra money. And often I was taken in by Irish families, Italian families, Black families, Latino families. No Asian, unfortunately. I wish I had. And I got to learn about the cultures and traditions of these different backgrounds and families and their foods. There was an Irish family that would take me in basically every afternoon after first grade. And they had no money, but there were nine children. And they lived in a little apartment and we all sat around a big table and there was tea and bread and jam. And they would sing for hours. Really? And that was my first, they would sing Irish music. And that was my first exposure to that kind of large family setting. I'm an only child oh. in which people would not have much, but they would share the love and they really did. And it made such a strong impression on me. And then the Italian families said, you need to eat. <laughs> You're not eating properly. Oh, they said that so much now. And you know, our family, I the one who had the families of the neighborhood come into our home, there wasn't much diversity, but yeah. nevertheless, there was the love and there was yeah. the information always. And then you don't forget it. I'm sure. No, you know. I know. Uh, I, my first little girlfriend when I was about six was a black girl named Bernadette. And the next one was Eleanor. And Eleanor was uh, about eight and she was a wonderful singer. Mm -hmm. I knew even then that Eleanor was a very special singer. At she's that age. Now? I, I know I, I wish I knew where if, Eleanor if you're watching I have never forgotten you your last name starts with L mm -hmm. and um, I have never forgotten Eleanor 
because she was such a special person and a wonderful singer. And I used to sit there just transfixed by her singing and she would sing in the home. And um, she sang church music, she sang opera, she sang everything and with such assurance and, and, and Latino families taught me to dance. <laughs> so it was, this is part of the New York. Uh, no, I became a very good dancer and these, this New York kind of story is something that you may see in films and read in novels, but it lacks the texture that I know you and I experienced just growing up in the city that formed us and to which we feel very attached, even though we have been out in the world and done things in many happy places. Uh, and so I do want to get back to you. Um, people know that Martina... All, all this, I'm, in this, I'm involved with this. Yeah, you have been with me all the time, and I've been with your your stories. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you have sung in all the great theaters of the world. Uh, if maybe one was missing, I don't know. I don't know if you sang in Sydney, but apart from that, I did you sing in Sydney? No. How See that? I Australia. Yeah. I don't think I sang in Australia. That's okay. They can still have you. But you've sung at La Scala and Covent Garden and Vienna and Berlin and Buenos Aires, which is one of my favorite theaters in the world, Paris, Chicago, San Francisco. Um, Martina, by the way, was the 2013 Kennedy Center honoree, which is our highest arts award in the United States. Um, and I guess people think of your home theater as being the Metropolitan Opera. And you are so much a part of the Met family when that term used to be used all the time. And you sang many, many roles there. Uh, a lot of Leonora's of the two, of the Trovatore and the Forza, uh, Madama Butterfly, uh, obviously Aida, for which you're famous. You began as a celestial voice in Don Carlo. Oh, yeah. um, and one thing I discovered about that, that in your cast, that night in March of, of 1959 was Herman Uda who had was singing Ooh, the Grand Inquisitor. Cool. Now Martina what again I didn't know this until I researched this my very first opera performance was the week before your debut not as a performer but as a little boy I was two years and ten months and my first opera was actually Wozzeck starring Herman Uda and Eleanor Stieber because my cousin, Alice Plotkin, who became Alice Platon, was Marie's child in this production that was on the front page of the New York Times for its premiere. And um, Herman Uda, who I later met, um, was the Wozzeck that night. And, and I didn't connect the fact that about 10 days later for your debut, he had already left Wozzeck and was singing The Grand Inquisitor. He was a very knowledgeable man, and he was willing to share what he knew with someone who would just ask him. He had so much to say, so much he had learned so much, and uh, and sometimes he'd be very quiet. But if no one asked him, he didn't say anything. But when you asked him, out came this incredible amount of knowledge. And I, and I think he's dead now, isn't he? Yes, I think so. Um part of the interest in reviewing your career in preparation for this is that whenever I do this, I discover that artists I interview and converse with sang roles we may not have expected, but also that they appeared in casts with people who are legendary, some of them very famous, like Birgit Nielsen, of course. But also, I noticed that you were in a cast with Fedora Barbieri when you were singing La Gioconda, in 1975, she was singing La Checa, and Fedora Barbieri in 1975 was molto anziana, as the Italians say. And but she had one of these remarkable voices and personalities. Did and you backgrounds. She, and backgrounds? It was incredible. You know, Would you had talk had about her because Fedora she played your mother actually in this opera. Yes, but when we were together, it was usually a rehearsal or a performance, and we didn't get a chance to sit down and really chew the fat. You know, I did with some others when we had rehearsals, um, many rehearsals, but with her, I had very few because we weren't on stage singing that much. And she was, um, 
And some of the Italian singers didn't go out to meet because they were afraid of the language. But in our home, they could have spoken Italian or Spanish, really. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a few others and some German as well. We had lots of German singers come and visit and hang around the house. But I think it was also the kind of house that you could do that in. So that has a lot to do with it. But um, she, she was a very incredible lady. If you ask her something, she had a million stories. But if you don't ask her anything, she said nothing. Hmm. So another person I want to ask you about is very famous. And thank God he's still active. He recently conducted Fidelio in Florence. Zubin Mehta. Oh, Zubin Mehta is a phenomenal opera conductor who has not conducted the Met for about 40 years or perhaps more. And I've always considered that our loss in New York that we didn't have Subin Mehta conducting opera. He conducted for, and still for decades in Florence and in Munich particularly, but also Vienna everywhere, Israel. But um, I would love to, I would love to know you were conducted by Mehta in Torendot as Liu mm -hmm. with Birgit Nielsen and James King Yep. as the unknown fellow and Turandot herself. And yes, tell me about James King and Birgit Nielsen, but I really want to know about working with Subin Maida as an opera conductor. Well, first of all, you have to know that Subin, you would work with as a man. He was a wonderful, personable person, had always something to say, had always something to learn. Um, he, we would we were going on stage in, a, in an intermission and he, we'd be arguing about something else, not arguing in an ugly sense, but just discussing something else. And he, he, well, he was always interested in what was going on in the rest of the world, least of all interested in that performance that night. Yeah. You know, and uh, I haven't seen him except at a, at a distance or on, on some show in several years, but he's a very personable person. He's... Um, Oh, well, Subin is one of the people who's not an opera conductor. He's just a man of the world. He, he, he knows what's happening. What I find in his opera, I'm speaking specifically about opera right now, though he's a wonderful symphonic conductor. Yes. Um, an energy that very few conductors can match. Sometimes Valeria Gergiev gets it. Occasionally James Levine got it. Klaus Tenstedt would get it. Um, where just that vibrant pulse as a thing unto itself in the conducting. Yes, many conductors, wonderful, bring all kinds of other things to it. I would say that perhaps Ricardo Muti and Claudio Botto, just to name two, had energy, have energy, but it was not the dominant thing. Um, a Botto was a certain kind of emotional connection. And you disagree with me if you if you do and Muti, it's a certain kind of academic rigor. But with Zubin Mehta, it was kind of like plugging in a very bright light and just feeling the coursing energy. You, you know, you're right. It, I, I never realized what it was. Uh, when you work with Zubin, you're working with music and, and, and that, you forget he's Zubin, you know, he's, he becomes that, that representative of music. And he's, he's been that way throughout the years that I've known him, but I haven't seen him in so many years now to sit down and talk. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't remember ever sitting down and talking with him. It would be more like stand up and run with him. Uh, but he, he always, was always on the go, always something happening. You know, he, he, had, he was involved in some other affair, not I mean affairs, but that too, but nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> but he was always... Uh, keeping up with someone in just a mile ahead. Mm -hmm. And he, he has maintained that, um, that attitude. I don't know anything about him personally now because we, we, don't, we don't see each other. But I'm sure if we were to sit down now, we could pick up where we started the last time and ramble on. Well, I do know that um, in my study of Michelangelo, the artist, that he would, he, Michelangelo would give 33 pairs as a gift because he loved pears and 33 for the number of years in the life of Christ. Zubin Mehta gives Indian mangoes as his gift. Really? He and never I know gave me an Indian mango. He never gave me any kind of mango. Get in touch and ask him for some Indian mangoes. I'm on about <laughs> 150 of them, how many times we've met. <laughs> but one uh, 
when he was no, it, it's interesting. It, it's his currency. It, it's his way in. Not that he needs a way and he just has to say I'm Zubin Mehta. But um, it's his sort of welcoming gift or his connecting gift to, to people. I tasted one of them once in Florence. The gift was not to me, but I was at the home of the recipient and had one of these really gorgeous Indian mangoes. So you can call him up now and say, where are my mangoes? And then he says, who's Martina? Then I'll heal you. <laughs> so I also want to ask you about something that I unfortunately never got to hear, except I'm recording. Um, you had a Wagnerian phase at the Metropolitan Opera. Yes. And after this being the celestial voice, you then went right into a ring cycle as the third Norn and Voglinda and Ortlinda. Oh. And um, is it because, and by the way, your sisters in that were Rosalind Elias and Mignon Dunn as Norns and... And, and not only, um, who was the lady, the famous lady who also sang with us, and forgive me for not remembering her, her offhand, um, Jean... Jean oh. Kraft? Jean the, Madeira? Jean Madeira. The, the famous singers of the Met who sang these roles. You yeah. know, so we didn't feel like we were singing small roles at all. Yeah. But the, well, the Met assigned the role with the, to the, according to the voice, and we made lots of noise. I can imagine, but I also, you know, sometimes people are marked out for certain repertory. We talk about Nielsen that way. Uh, Leonie Riesenick sort of got out of that because she did Italian rep and German rec and so on. But um, did they ever say to you early on, we see you in the German Fach, the German repertory, or? People said, why aren't you singing more German? That this is what your voice is, what we need is your type of voice in the German repertoire. And we just didn't. It always stayed, stayed Italian for most of my life. I mean, but I'm you were happy, also, but... and I, I sure wish I had been taken to hear this. I was 12. Um, you sang Elsa in Lohengrin. In 1968. Yeah, one of my favorite operas, Sandra Konya. Oh. Um, I mean, <laughs> Borislav Klobuchar was the conductor. My goodness, you have a memory. <laughs> But Elsa's a beautiful role. It's also, I in my research, one of the two longest roles in opera along with Susanna in Le Nozze di Figaro. It's a lot of music. It's a lot of time on stage. It's a lot of suffering. Now, your, your Italian ladies suffer a lot too, but it's a, the value system is kind of different. And I would love to know, given that you are a sunny, empathic, caring, intelligent person. Who are you talking about? You, sunny, empathic, caring, and intelligent. I'll, I'll take those words. But Elsa is not sunny. She makes a lot of errors, I think. Um, she pushes Lohengrin to reveal his name, even though she, I think she knows it will cost her dearly. And so where did you weave yourself into the character and how did you form that role particularly because people have heard you talk about your Italian roles and we will but this was the one that I wanted to know how you made her happen for the stage. I started through the music without a doubt because there's so much more in music than we we, we get from the singers that are put on stage with it when you have to make the part live with through the words and the sound of the, of the, of the music, you, you'd be surprised how much more you can get into it if you just didn't worry about what people heard and if it was loud enough. Um, Elsa is one of the beautiful roles that, that most, one of the most beautiful roles really, where she says so much with every word. And you're not allowed to say but so much with the Wagnerian operas. Uh, as you are with the Italian or, or American, but the Wagnerian operas have, have a, a, a melody of, of a meaning of their own. And sometimes we could get into it and sometimes we get, didn't. Some singers never get into it and you wonder why. Mm -hmm. But um, Elsa, she was, oh gosh, she was, she was lovely to sing. She was, she was I, hung, I hummed, sing, I sang Elsa humming around the house because mm -hmm. it was that beautiful. 
and that was some meaningful, not so much beautiful, but beautiful and meaningful. Lohengrin, I never say I have a favorite opera. When I'm forced to, I will say it's Don Carlo. But in general, I have a group of favorite operas that I live with and that are part of me. And one of them that is definitely part of me is Lohengrin. Yes. Uh, just for so many reasons, the music itself, but also the messages in the opera, the ideas of the opera, the... Um, to me, when I'm asked to teach her lecture about Lohengrin, I describe it as an opera about belief. And belief cuts so many ways because belief can be about politics, it could be about oneself, it could be about religion. But the character of Ortrude, who is sort of the antagonist of Elsa, I think of as an old believer. Um, like in Kovanchina, they're the old believers and that she's from a different belief system from Elsa and from Lohengrin. And when you have this clash of beliefs and these desires for having it, not necessarily having your way, but seeing that what you believe in be shared and experienced and either harming everybody else or, or helping everybody else, it's, it's, it's about all that. It's also a Christian opera. It's also an opera about a man who is, I think, rather misunderstood. Um, th there's so much going on in that opera. Yeah, but you know, it's funny, when you're a young singer or even an old singer, they don't get that far into the meaning of the characters and, the, and what they're saying, what they're truly saying. And consequently, very often, you don't get this bit of talking, discussion about it until late on in life or never, you know, and, and just learning it and singing it is not the way to do an opera, but that's the way we do it, unfortunately, because we learn and sing the performance, you know, and that's a, a great, great pity. So this, Martina, leads me to a question that I was going to ask you about 20 minutes from now, but I'm going to do it now. Your Martina Royal Foundation, Prelude to Performance, and the website is martinaarroyofdn.org is a very special organization because there are many so-called young artist programs and foundations that train and teach young singers and young artists, young directors, designers, whatever. Yours is very different. I know that because I've taught in many and I've taught in yours, so I know the experience. Um, and one thing that I always grapple with wherever I teach is what you just alluded to, namely, if you have a 30 year old in front of you who may have a lot of contemporary life experience, but not necessarily have, I don't wanna say past life experience, but I mean, experience from days before they were born, from different generations, from different cultural values. Uh, if you're talking about an opera, say um, La Traviata or Trovatore, or many of these operas, where women are treated very differently and experience things very differently and where men are brutish and some of them are caring and some of them are passionate, but a lot of them are cruel. Um, this may not be what the young people have experienced. No. And I try so much in so many ways, whether through literature, through music, through lyrics, through visual arts, especially to show what the characters might be feeling. So would you please, Martina, because your role class is very famous at the Martina Royal Foundation for your approach. And given that we know that you have taught as a teacher and you certainly have, you know, remarkable background as an artist, how do you do role study for young people who may not have the life experience that you have? Well, we certainly don't emphasize the singing part of it. We go away from the singing and bring up the character, what the times were, the people of the day, the other people, and we build up um, a knowledge of, of another life for them, you know, and, and they have to live in that life. And very often they come out feeling like they're somebody totally different. They're no longer, they're John Smith, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and we let them live in that period when they're in class. 
And sometimes the, the, the students will come and say, you know, I went home, I couldn't get her out of my mind or get him out of my mind. Uh, and it was so, it was so strong. And you have to go through a little bit of that. You have to go through a little bit of, of, of losing yourself, your, your important self. Your self is not so important. And when you've done that, and you can bring that character into the, make someone else understand that, then, you, then you're beginning to touch what, what it's about. But very often when you're touching what it's about, you vocally go off. Mm -hmm. And so to then bring them back to the vocal side of it, and some people will say, well, if they're really in character, they should, they should, it should be already in the voice. No, it's not always in the voice. You have to bring it into the voice. You have to work with it. You have to make it, you have to make it go into the voice, so to speak. And that's the most fun. The kids that how they, how they turn out at the end of a couple of sessions, a couple of years with, with, the, with the teachers, because they get different teachers. They don't get singers as teachers necessarily, but they come out really say, you know, that guy was really so, such a touch. Or that lady, she didn't mean that then. No, she didn't. You have to find all that out. And, and one reading of a, of, a, of a score does not give it to you. And too often, all we get is one reading. We don't take time to get into character and to find out who she is or who he is and why he did that. And, and, and that's a, it's, it's such a great fun when you can come out saying, well, I learned that part. I learned the part, you know, who it was. So I often, uh, yes, often, it's the right word. I often, when I work with young people, hear the same sentence back from them and, and I don't take it as a criticism but it tells me about them when they tell me that something either about a character or about an event in an opera is not realistic they say that's not realistic um, I know how I address that how do you address that well if it's not realistic you haven't you're not studying it well hmm. you know you're not getting you haven't gotten from the beginning but that you have to go back. You know, that's what I find difficult to do. You learn a couple of um, arias and you say, now I know the part, you know, we're near, you know, we're near that part. Mm. And then when you find out that there's so much more, you haven't got the time to give it, to, to be able to say that. And then when you take the time and you make yourself learn it, you come out saying, what, why did I think such a, another way altogether? You, I don't believe in this learning a part on Friday and singing it the next Saturday. Um, not if you're talking about a part, if you're talking about um, skimming through something for a performance, that's one thing perhaps, but to learn a character, to learn a part of a character and bring him to life, it takes much, much longer. You have to live that life or not live it, but you have to understand what he's saying. And that's not always easy. And you have very often, you don't have the people to go to to find out when to make it easy. You know, or they'll go to a class and all you have to do is sing it. Well, singing is not all. So therefore, to go further on the Martina Royal Foundation's philosophy, while many organizations and programs and conservatories where I've taught focus mostly on the music and then we'll have a passing nod to stage deportment to move, oh, no, movement and so on. Character. The character, you have to go into that. If you want to say you know that part, you have to go into that character very deeply. And sometimes it, it doesn't make you sing better and you sing some ugly things. Sometimes you, you, you develop a character that you don't want to see yourself do. You want to see yourself as singing beautifully all the time. And it's not going to be always beautiful. So I'm not going to name them because that's not the point here, but I can think of two very esteemed American superstar opera singers, one male, one female, who I admire greatly. I've worked with both. I love them. <clears throat> but I think it's fair to characterize them as highly intellectual. They're very, very, very intelligent and scholarly and, and wise, and I love to talk and listen to them. But sometimes on the stage, they bring their intellect to moments where I don't, I don't want to see their understanding of the character. I don't know what you're talking about. I'll, I'll send you an email. <laughs> but 
I see their understanding of the character, but I don't quite see them get into the character because their scholarship, their worldliness. I mean, these are two great people, but they, I just feel with them that I can see their work, their study, their knowledge, but I don't, not in every case, but in some cases don't quite get into the character they're playing in a way that other people who may connect on a much more visceral emotional level bring that to me, even if they don't have that intellect. You don't believe them simply. They get on stage and you don't believe them. Hmm? And yeah. there's also the other part of it, the importance of when you get on stage, how do you sound? You know, and that's very made very important for us. So uh, you have these things working against you and some working for you. Which do you accept? It depends on your character. I've heard the singers singer sing roles that were actually ugly, but they were so much more the character, but they were ugly. And other singers who sounded beautiful and said nothing. Yeah. I think in the first category, one of my very favorites, Leonie Riesenek, who was willing to allow her voice to go ugly to, for, I don't want to say dramatic effect, dramatic impact, because when she was firing on all burners dramatically, there was nothing like that. Near her. But she stopped that soon when she started, people started criticizing the voice. Yeah. Then she made the choice, which is more important, the character or the voice, she said the voice. Whereas I yeah. was torn up by the character sometimes. I know. But late in the career, when she would go to roles who were more mezzo-soprano roles, she allowed the character part to come forth again in a, in a major way. But um, so the question is, at what point does acting enter this role development? Because we can have an understanding of it. We can learn from the music and the words, but then the singer is called upon to act, I not only by herself, but usually with other people. Yes, and you know, the awful thing is, when I was coming up and growing, I never became, in anybody's opinion that I heard of me, call me an actress. They didn't understand what I knew of the role or what I felt that there. nobody considered me, I don't know what you had to do to make them understand that you understand. But I, I know people who thought, oh, she's a beautiful singer, uh, uh, some who thought I was not a beautiful music uh, and they never talked about acting and about how it goes in and how you bring it out of yourself. What do you say? You say nothing. They have their opinions and what do they know what you feel? And in this case, are you talking about so-called critics and reviewers or members of the opera going public? Both. I mean, people have said to me, it's a pity. Oh, you sing so beautifully. It's a pity, I, you know, the character isn't stronger. And I think that might have been a night when my the character was so strong in my heart and in my thoughts that uh, I thought that I'd sacrificed the voice, but nobody ever thought that. That was not my experience with you. I can say well before I met you that I was drawn in and completely captivated by everything. One of the first roles I heard you in was Elvira in Ernani. Ah, which is a much undervalued opera in my view. It was Verdi's fifth opera, but it was also the opera where he made many great strides as an artist. It was the first time that in effect, he gathered soprano, um, tenor, baritone and bass, where there was interaction among the four characters that had dramatic impact, where uh, Ernani was a charismatic outlaw where Elvira, your character, was, let's say, put upon by men competing for her, um, where each of the roles had very strong solo arias, but there were also duets. There's a fabulous trio at the end. Um, it really knocked me out because I didn't know it before at all. I'd not heard a recording when I heard you perform it. And with Carla Bergonzi and Cheryl Milnes and Ruggiero Ramondi, uh, Ramondi and I went on to become very good friends and work together a lot. And he taught me to make, he's from Bologna, the Bolognese ragu. The ragu <laughs> that I make is Ruggiero Ramondi's Bolognese ragu. Yeah. Well, write me over tomorrow. 
<laughs> and actually, now that I think about it, Bergonzi taught me to make folded pasta. But um, talk about specifically, I love Cheryl Milnes, and please talk about him if you wish. But these two Italian men, Raimondi and Bergonzi, and what they brought to the opera Ernani, which was probably better known to them than to New York audiences. Well, first of all, they're saying words and that have meaning for them immediately. And so there's an immediate giving of feeling. And when Cheryl, even though we had done the translation and we knew what they were, we had to still hop over trans, uh, trans, translate in your mind. So there was that holding you against, but I don't, I think, that many of the things that Cheryl did uh, and, and other artists um, who were first translating, they didn't first translate, they had, to, they had to say it in a way that it made sense to them as a translation, if you know what I mean. I, I don't mm -hmm. think you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, if I have to know first that it means, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a bridge you have to you cross. Whereas when someone was singing in, if I sang that in English, it would be there immediately. And I don't know if, if um, and you had from some of the singers who had, who had had the information for them immediately, who don't do it anyway, because they're not interested in the translation. I'm not interested in them mm -hmm. because they don't interest me. But if, if you get a feeling that they, he, he at least understands who he is or she is, I, I, feel, I feel much better about it. And on the other hand, I can tell you, I'm sure that there are people who say that I didn't know what I was talking about. And I spoke, to, I spoke Italian. Yeah, so I, I knew what I was saying, you know, they, sometimes people have opinions of you before they hear you. You know, so you, you just put up with it and say nothing. But, but there's something very important about what the person feels about the role itself before that you see them do it. And unfortunately, we don't always get to see the translation of it. So this leads the way back to teaching again. Um, in my experience, when I've taught people in their native language, sometimes there's a carelessness about the language because they know it. So yeah, they don't they didn't even care about it. Yeah. I mean, Luciano Pavarotti was a splendid interpreter of Italian language in addition to great singing. But I've worked with other Italians who are careless, who just sing it because they know the words, but they don't caress the vowels and the consonants and read where there's a doubling of an M or an L or things like that. And they don't connect the words to the music the way Luciano did. I'm naming him, but there were there are plenty of other Italians. But I've worked with, frankly, the role of Aida. I've worked with certain Italians who just slur everything and they don't. They don't give the meaning. Numi pietà del mio straziato core, core. Um, they will just say it out because they know the words. Yeah, but that's because they're not, they're not paying any attention to what they're saying. Mio straziato core means nothing to them. But if you say it with the meaning that it has, that you, you have to give emphasis on the words and, and the color of that word. On the other hand, if you have singers who don't, pay any attention to any of that. They, they think, think that it must all be beautiful. You know, so what do you do? You, you go to the one you want to hear and you listen to it and shut up, or you go to the one that says something to you and you get much more from it. So because you and I are speaking in English now, let's take an English language opera. I'm going to name Stravinsky's The Reg's Progress, but it can be any, but I named that one because of its libretto. Um, where we're working with artists whose native language is English, young artists, and yet they don't necessarily, some of them are wonderful at finding language and using language, but many don't because it's their language. How in English you teach that to an English speaker? Because it's different from reading the Italian translation and learning that language, but when it's your own language, how does that work for for? awakening the role in a, in a young artist? Well, first of all, I, I don't teach it to, I'm not teaching them the language. They, they come knowing the language. So they have to know what they're saying. That's very important in any language, in any opera, to know exactly what you're saying and what does that evoke from you? Um, 
the moment that when I get to a student and a student who's thinking about his singing of the language, does that sound right? He's you're going to have a problem there. That's a big problem. When you get to someone who's not singing for you, and, and I would always have some rehearsal where you don't sing the language, you just speak those words. And you, and you find that the students very often go back to that when they're trying to, to do it, actually act the part. Um, but you, you can't leave the language out of any of performance that you do because the language is what makes the performance. It's, it's also what makes you, what you say important. You can't leave the language out. It's what you say to the next person that evokes the next, the answer to that, what you said. All of that's important, extremely important. I have found, I've found some of my notes from one of your role study classes that I attended years ago. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis, background on the role, historical perspective of the role, psychological motivation of the character, use of body and voice in interpretation of character, use of language to convey character uh, with an emphasis on diction, mm -hmm. diction. Um, diction has caused many a, a young singer to fail in what they're trying to do because they are you know, they're pronouncing too much. Of, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, mm -hmm. so as it happens, one of these two over intellectual, oh, not over, super intellectual singers I referred to characterizes her diction that everything is perfectly, exceedingly pronounced in but whatever like, language she sings in. Pardon <laughs> me? <laughs> you don't understand them at all. <laughs> no, I know that. And we focus so much on the placement of the T and the P and, and such whatever language she sings in, that we lose track of this. I find I lose track of the singing mm -hmm. sometimes and, and the role interpretation. Your students, and I've seen many, many of them in your program, and then after I follow them and I see them on the stages of the world, um, they're marked out as different to me because something in their formation the way you spoke about your early awakening at Hunter College High School, I suspect that they're experiencing a similar thing in the Martina Royal Foundation Prelude to Performance because I can spot those singers in the best possible way when I see them in the world. And sometimes I'll see one and then look up and see that he or she was a participant in your program and sometime since 2003 when you founded it. And it's kind of like the, the old novel and film, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Uh -huh. Give me a gal at five years old and she's a Brody girl for life. Uh -huh. and, the, the <laughs> and I find the Martina Royal imprimatur in the best sense. It's not that they're all doing the same thing, but they all bring certain kinds of values to their creation of their roles. That all to me, some yeah, of them. Some, some of them. them, the good ones that I've seen. Well, I mean, there are, there are ones where I'll see them and not know and not think, but then there are others who I will say, gee, this one has some of the hallmarks of Martina Royo role study. And then you'd see some you wish hadn't had to gotten those hallmarks. Because mm. they had other things happen in their development or in lack of development, whatever you want to call it. But there's something about studying anything that you put the time into finding out what it means that, that changes it all together than from the one who just reads through it or just learns it, uh, you know, ad hoc. I, I don't know how you would say that they just learn it, but mm -hmm. the ones who come in and work at it, there's always something different. And they take it, student, I speak to some of my students every week uh, who call me really every week to say hello. And they say how much they had to put into the work themselves because I hadn't given this to them and they hadn't gotten it from a teacher. They had to learn how to put these things themselves into the, into the character, into the words, and they do it because that's the only way they know how to do it once you learn how to do it. I am going to name one individual because she's sensational. Cecilia Violetta Lopez, who I saw as Violetta in La Traviata 
a few years ago, I would guess six or seven years ago at your foundation at its annual performances. Mm -hmm. And I've seen her since as Violetta. Really? In other places. And as wonderful and as complete as she seemed back then, it's even deeper now. Musically, be. dramatically, it's more detailed even than it was. And it was phenomenal. I mean, I think everybody who witnessed that thought that we had seen a Violetta arrive who had been doing it for 50 years because it was so deep. Yeah. And she was, was and is a young woman. And she... Um, is of Mexican parentage. She grew up in Idaho. She's had her challenges. And somehow the challenges of her life were poured into her performance, but it's, it was not about her. It was about her character, but somehow moments of pain and vulnerability and things being taken away from her, as happens with Violetta and, and Giorgio's father, uh, Alfredo's father, Giorgio Germont. Um, I didn't need to know anything about her background to feel this so powerfully. She really was one of the great Violettas I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of great Violettas, but she was just astonishing. She, and yeah, she brought a lot of that with her. She, you, some, you don't start from nowhere. You, you, you start at different places in, uh, of your life. And she came ready to do that. She, she had so much in, in her already that was just wanted to express something. Then you have someone else who will come in completely dead and they'll learn something, something, but they'll never reach where she, she started already feeling these things. And some people never have the experience of having felt those things. So you can't take that, you can't blame them for that. And that's, part of why it's not that I want people who want to be opera singers to have terrible lives. And I'm not saying she has, but what I mean is that life experience contributes to what we do on the stage. Oh, certainly. And it, we, we don't have to be Tosca to, or have Tosca's experiences to understand what Tosca feels mm -hmm. or Violetta or Donna Anna, another role of yours that I adore. Um, but you know, I love the roles of Tosca and 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 uh, and and those the dramatic roles that bring so much to the music that you almost don't have to do as much because it's it, all you do is read the line, read the words, read the music, and it, it's right there, handed to you like here you are, madam, take that. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people don't even use that for them. I'm going to go to Mozart. I think that. Le Nozze di Figaro and Don Giovanni, and particularly Don Giovanni, may be the two hardest operas to stage for a stage director. Right. Don Giovanni has two acts, 17 scenes, constantly changing situations. And yes, there's the Pontes libretto that says things as he does often in a, in a double way or, or a contradictory way. But Mozart, in his genius, makes it even more complicated by putting music that makes it more contradictory. And I've had the honor, and I say it as an honor, of working on several productions of Don Giovanni. And with each director and conductor I've worked with on that, they have different approaches and therefore, especially Anna and Elvira, well, more than Giovanni and more than Leporello, that relationship, mm -hmm. but Anna and Elvira, Everything is different every single time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Elvira has made the prominent character. Sometimes Anna has made the prominent character. I found in recent years that Anna is getting more of the attention. But oh, isn't that true? In the 80s, it was Elvira. When I first started working on, opera, on productions of Giovanni, Elvira was the focus because I, they said to me, well, she's the last one. She's the one who comes to warn Giovanni. And my answer is that Anna starts the whole thing and, and it's Anna's father who's killed, not, not Elvira's father. And I mean, we can parse that opera magnificently because very little is dictated except the words and the music. But from that, the singers, the conductor, the orchestra, the chorus, the stage director, 
have to come to some kind of conclusion and consensus. And I think it's one of the hardest operas to cast because, and I've worked where a production where an artist had to drop out and someone else comes in and the chemistry entirely changes. Oh, that should always happen even with the same person. That's one of the things that is required that you, if you're involved enough that it changes it for you. Yeah. And that's not easy to do. How did you build your Donna Anna as a characterization? How did I build Donna Anna? First of all, you surprising one of your, my answer is, depends on how you sing it that night because you don't always sing it the same way. And how you sing it and what it's, where, where your emphasis are with the words and everything in the opera has a lot to do with what the people receive or what you receive. Um, there is no one way of singing that is always, it can always, you have the same staging. I don't care what anybody says, you've got to change in that opera, you, you change. And if you don't change, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other people change. Yeah. So you're receiving things that are different. And, and especially an opera like that with the way you think that everything is the same because this is Mozart and you don't change Mozart too much. Baloney, mm -hmm. you know, you have to, you have to, uh, from the very entrance of the very first character, the first words that are said could be said differently. But um, I don't think you should rely on any one performance or what he, any one set of directions to get your character for the evening. I think that that changes of itself. Um, and your colleagues, just how they, they work that night change. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's, that, that's just what, I, what seems natural to me that you change and that they do change every night and that you, you, you bring something different every night. That seems the, like the most natural part of the whole process, if you know what I mean. You, it's never. I, I, I believe I do. But would you say that that is either unique to the opera Don Giovanni or? To every opera. Every opera, okay. So that an opera that may seem more structured, such as Ernani, for example, mm -hmm. which has set pieces Verdi had not fully explored his dramatic side. He was exploring the musical side with dramatic feelings in there, not. It was his early 1844, I think, or 45. Um, but nonetheless, the way Elvira interacts with the three men, Arenati, Carlo, and Silva, I think his and name how is. how they react. Oh. I mean, everything is, it, it's come from everybody. No, not, not from any one person. There's, there's no one person dictates how it's going to go that night. So therefore in teaching young artists this very important lesson, mm -hmm. how is it communicated to them that you don't just have your Anna and you come out and you sing her, but you have to be in the moment and listen to you among your many things that I'm praising you now as someone who knows opera, not as your friend. On the stage, we're a fabulous listener. And I always knew that your character was listening to the people who were singing and talking to you and not simply waiting for your cue for your next line. No, you have to do it that way or else you, you do it only one way. I'm sorry, when you don't know what's happening, you, if you know it only one way, you can only answer one way and it never should be one way from anybody. So if everybody's doing the same thing, working on the moment and how you say it, it will be definitely different. And then there are, I don't like to talk about stage mishaps, but there are delayed entrances. There are things where um, Elie viene, he's coming, but he doesn't come for whatever reason okay. because the sword got stuck or whatever. Well, How do you teach? Honest, it doesn't come. <laughs> you know, he just, he's just <laughs> not there. You have to How do you teach something. your young artist how to react in those situations where it's what is supposed to happen by the music and the libretto is not happening. First of all, put them in scenes where that, that really happens, you know, because even when you're in practicing, it happens and you watch their reaction, but you have to be involved with them at all times. 
and you have and they react differently. Some will do exactly the same thing no matter what you say, that's their action. Mm -hmm. And no matter how wrong it is, that's their action. And you have to work on them harder than the ones who adjust immediately to what's going on. Yeah. So in addition to the role study class, there are other programs involved in the Martina Royal Foundation course. I'm going to call it a course, although it's probably not the best word, uh, including weekly individual coachings, mm -hmm. opera workshops such as stage movement, uh, character development, combat fighting, makeup, costuming, stage direction, management, and so on. Um, recitative study. We were just talking about Mozart. A recitative. Will you talk about how you teach recitative study and what we want from a from a I don't singer? Know if we have a way of teaching it. We I think we first let them come in and everybody does his recitative the way he learned it. You just do it. Do you react to people? You pick, you know the ones who are reacted to people or who know, know the other, don't know the other one is there. You know the ones who are waiting to react to the. You you soon little by little pick out the ones that are giving and getting more, more or less. And then you try to work with that one um, in that way and to correct what is not uh, as it should be. I don't think you can have a set of rules that will go for all of the students because they're, they're different people. Mm -hmm. so there are sing singers who come in and they come in, they know those recitatives, but they know theirs and the other person's. So they expect the other person to react the way they're gonna, they, they hear it. And then you have someone who doesn't learn the other part at all. You know, they know they're about what they're saying and they know what they're saying. Then you know the one who does it, what might be the ideal way is having an idea of what's being said, but knowing what you're saying, but how you say it differs each time depending on how you're reacted to. And then you, you have all kinds of ways to figure out what's going on and to find out that they don't know what's going on or that they do know what's going on. It's a wonderful um, collaboration between you and the student and the student and the next person they're singing with or just themselves. Um, I love those classes. I just, they, they're always fun. And they're then you also fun. have them speak, libretto study, you have them speak their parts. Oh yes. Which is in other words, as it would be a play. Yes. Yeah. Do you have them speak it in English if it's an Italian opera, or do you have them speak it in the Italian? In Italian, but then they must speak it in English so I know that they know what they're saying. Right. You know, you can't come in and, uh, and just rattle off some other language and not know what you're saying. That makes no sense at all. Or you get the one who can do the translation, but they don't know what they were saying in Italian, or where's yep. the emphasis in Italian? You know, so you... you you have a, a marvelous situation of lots to learn, lots to learn. You just can't come, come into a class and think you know it all because another, another attitude toward that phrase will screw you up. Something that I learned in my study of production, I studied with various people, but primarily Tito Gobi, Franco Zeffirelli and Giorgio Streller. Um, I learned from Streller to have them improvise in their native language the action. So for example, yes. I once worked on a production in Florence of Lohengrin where they were singing in German, but many of the performers were not Germans. Mm -hmm. They were Italians, there were some Russians and there were some English speaker. We did this in Italian. I had them enact the stories of the opera of Lohengrin in Italian improvisationally so that we could work them into their roles that way before we actually got to the libretto. And it was very interesting because it made them have to be their characters without having the text to rely on. They had to improvise. Mm -hmm. That's and too many ways of doing the things that yeah. evokes that sort of a reaction. And when now, you get and, it, it's, it's, it's really, it makes them think and they finally really realize they have to think. You know, they can't just go on uh, absentmindedly. They have to know what's happening all the time, not yeah. only to me, but to you. 
but also I would add in most opera roles without anticipating what's coming. So I don't think Scarpia knows he's going to be stabbed. No. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, he his actions are based on the assumption that he's about to have sex with Tosca and not be killed by her. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, you know, and any I number of things, the notes that he figured out in the second act, who's going to pop out of the closet? It's not Carabino, it's Susanna. You know, uh, but the, and someone is going to pop out of the closet. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but the countess and the count have no idea. They expect it will be Carabino, but for their different reasons. Yeah. So they're both shocked, but in different ways. Susanna, Susanna. Um, on the other hand, they, when they are given some sort of pre noting before and they and they expect someone else, that's a different type of shock. That's yeah. beautiful. It really is. So another question I have is that you're in the Martina Royal Foundation, another thing that's taught is makeup. And when I was coming up and when you were coming up, I think that there were at least two ideas about makeup. There were some artists, especially Tito Gobi in my personal experience, who always did their own makeup. And then there were other artists who had a makeup person come in and do their makeup. And not just for something like a witch in Hansel and Gretel, but even Leonora, who just had to be an attractive person on the stage. Um, and some people themselves, did you in your singing career do your own makeup? Did you have other people do it for you? European opera houses where there was no person, you might be a guest and ask for a makeup artist, but most of the time you, you did yourself. And it was only in houses like the Met, um, or the Met thinking, how, thinking the way they do that they should be made up, that you have or someone make you up. You, you don't go in and sit down and sit quietly while he does it, you, you're working, you're putting your makeup on. And you also have performances where the makeup is to look a certain way because the whole thing is to, vision, to envision some idea and you have to find out what that is and, and, and perhaps even try it once or twice before you get what you want or what you, someone else wants in that case. Tito Gobi did the makeup. He would do drawings before of his character and the attachment of the posture of the character or certain kind of nose for Scarpia or Falstaff. Um, Stephanie Blythe, I know the mezzo-soprano likes to do her own makeup as a means of transitioning into the character. Mm -hmm. But I know others who prefer to be made up, especially because they, they don't want to think about that. They want, they want it just on their face, especially if it's a makeup for a production that has particular lighting or costuming or wig work that is particular. Well, yes, that's true. If you know that you're supposed to look a certain way, you're expected to look a certain way. I find it better to have someone who knows what that way is to do it for me than for me to try to make me look like something else when I don't, when I don't know how to do it, especially because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but there are houses that you just come in and you're given the makeup, you're told to make, go be ready to be on stage and you don't know what that character is to be. That's harder. <laughs> There are characters that you can just go make up naturally. I don't think Regina Resnick, not Regina Resnick, Regina, ah, the other lady, the lady of Scrano. We just call her name. Regine Crispin? No. No, not Miss Bell. Oh, she used to do fantastic makes of makeup. She did, I know. She's a great lady, was a great lady. Yeah. Um, no, I'm sticking the other. Oh, I'm sorry. We got, let's talk more. It'll so I'm going to talk about Regine Crispin since she came up. She yeah. taught me one of, it was just one sentence, but it's just, it changed my life as an opera worker. And not only, um, her language skills were so extraordinary yes. that when we did Carmelites and I worked on that production in English, whereas Poulenc had always wanted whatever country you were in to do it in Italian and Italy and English and America and Canada and Britain and uh, French in France and so on, German and Germany and Austria. And, but the Met was doing it in English and Regine Crispin, a French woman, had the best English diction of anyone in the cast Regine. where a lot of the others were Americans. Um, but that was Regine, when she came on, she was the best she could be in that place. Right. She was always like that. Right. 
And the line, the, the sentence, the philosophy that she taught me was, il faut vivre la langue, you must live the language. And by that she meant not simply learn the language, but live its nuances, live its sensuality or its contradictions or whatever, really live the language so that when I am working in Italian, based really on Regine Crispin's advice, I live that language. I, I live in that language, but I live that language and the culture behind it. That's much more than just simply knowing the words and being able to converse and conjugate my verbs, but to live the language. And Crispin was the model of that. And, and when I look back at her performances and I listen to them, her Wagner was extraordinary because her Siglindas, her Elsas were, she lived that language. Yes, but not every, everybody has the opportunity to do that or the, the, the sub people around them that allows them to do that or the uh, situation that allows her to be that way. She, she, she created her, her own situations to make it happen. And Regine was a very special lady. She was, um, I don't know, she was an, an ex exceptional woman. She had, she went in the direction always that she found the best. She yeah. didn't follow anybody's. And I loved Regine very much. Wow, well, see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I Martina, think I, love you. I love you. Thank you. And you too. I, unless there's something else we want to add, I know that you and I could speak for hours, but I wanted that our new year for all of us, not just you and me, but for your foundation, for all young artists, for all people who love music, for everyone in the world that we somehow find a way to love a lot more in 2022 than we, some of us have been doing before. And, you know, it sounds facile to say that, but love and kindness take us so far in moments of adversity. Uh, there are certain opera characters who express that very well. And when I have said about 10 times now in our conversation that I love you, I want, I'm not saying that to brag, but really I want you to understand how much you awaken that's good in other people and how much you mean to a lot of us. But and people, that's why I wanted so you as my New Year's baby. <laughs> so much, you know, the, the things you're saying, complimenting me in, in a way, but those are the same things I feel about so many of my friends, so many of my colleagues that are friends, because you're not a friend or a colleague. Uh, and, and we need that love to, to keep going. We, we don't go, we don't move. Oh, we can't move when there's no love there. And so, and you know it immediately when two people meet, are they going toward each other or are they walking away? We have to just go toward each other more. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more. And I don't mean <laughs> going toward a good looking guy or something like that. I mean, going toward humanity and teaching the young people that they must go also toward humanity. Because we, what we, re we represent are, hum are humane, are humane, humane people. On, in, let's say that again. What we represent is humanity. Mm -hmm. Okay, you yes. understand what I mean. But um, I I'm getting tongue tied now because I'm being mo I'm moved. But the young people need it more than ever. They need more than ever to know that we're standing with them, behind them, on the side of them, ready to give the push forward, and they can come to us. You know, so many think. Well, I didn't think I could come to you. Well, darling, who can you go to if you don't go to the one? who's already done it, who has this experience, who do you go to? So the, this holiday season should bring to them a message, I hope, of not only great love, but we have love for each other, we must. And not only great experiences, or well, wonderful experiences, you just remember, as you get older, you remember the time that such and such happened. Keep those close to you, keep them always alive, and, and you will live longer. You will live happier. And for you, I wish loads and loads of love and loads and loads of hugs. And just know that I'm always here when you want me. Just call. Thank you. you. Know, don't you? 
and <laughs> and happy new year. Happy new and I do hope that you know this pandemic will go in a direction that will allow us to be together physically mm -hmm. and also to resume classes for the Martina Royal Foundation. Mm -hmm. I want people in the meantime to visit the website to, this is my pitch, not Martina's, to consider donating to support their good work, martinaarroyofdn.org. And because she and everybody who works with her are creating the next generation of great opera singers, and we need that. Thank and you. Thank you for doing that. Creating themselves, they're doing what they're doing, should just be increased to more. To more. And the teacher people that are in the positions of hiring them, hire them, give them a chance to be what they can be, the best they can be. Don't just do um, lip service. That means very little. Get behind them. I will see you soon in 2022, my dear. I certainly hope so. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you.